when I wake up to sleep no more. That's an old one. Revelation chapter 15. We have been in a series on the book of Revelation uh, entitled The Apocalypse. And uh, this is the uh, unveiling of end times. And the Apostle John uh, was caught up and allowed to see all of this on the Isle of Patmos. It was in a vision, given him a vision. And uh, he wrote about it. And you and I have um, tremendous understanding of what the world is going to be like after we're taken away. And the rapture, which we believe contextually took place in chapter 3. I want to remind you that in studying the book of Revelation and studying any type of prophecy, there should be a cleansing effect it should have on us. It should challenge us of just how close the hour is that Jesus Christ could come back and get us and we should be ready to meet him. That means that we're not just that we're saved, that that means we're keeping our sin on short accounts. It also means that we're doing our best to serve the Lord and get people into the family of God. Secondly, it should alert us to our loved ones that need the Lord Jesus Christ, and we should be even more evangelistic as we, as we read and study about the nearness of the Lord's return. But I want you to understand, I say this from time to time, that as we read about some of the things like we will tonight, and just how close these things are, it lets us know that if the Bible's talking about this during that seven-year history we call the Great Tribulation, if the Bible's talking about things that we understand now, then that's how close we are. So t t tonight, for instance, we'll talk about a little bit about global warming. Now, I, I do not believe in the political idea that's being thrown at us about global warming. I think there's, they have an economic benefit from that. But if you ask me, do I think there will be global warming? Absolutely there will be global warming. In fact, God's going to burn this whole planet up and make it new again. Somebody say amen right there. Now, we're not happy about that big fire that's going to happen, but we are happy that we're going to be gone, amen, in heaven. And um, so uh, as we study the book of Revelation, we should understand there is a reason for it. And the Bible tells us in the very first chapter that we're blessed when we read and study this particular book. We're blessed to read any book of the Bible, but especially the book of Revelation. So don't go to sleep at the wheel. We're actually going to take two chapters tonight. The first chapter is very short. Let's stand together, please, read of God's Word. We're actually read chapter 15. Chapter 15, eight verses in chapter 15. We're going to look at chapter 16, which con contains the vile judgments. Vile judgments. I tell you what, from here on out, I'm going to call it a bold judgment. The vile, actually, there were seven of them. And uh, the vile is a picture of a, some type of a vase with a closed, closed, enclosed neck on it that carries a liquid. In this sense, the plagues, the last seven plagues. But the, the idea is also transliterated as a bowl. And so some call it the bold judgments that are poured out on the earth. Verse number 1, chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses and the, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Chapter 16, the first two verses, you have the first vow. Verse 3, the second vow. Verses 4 through 7, the third vow. Verses 8 and 9, the fourth vow. The fifth vow found in verses 10, 11, sixth vow, 
12 through 16, and the last vow or bold judgment poured out on the earth, verses 17 through 21. I want you to draw your attention to verse number 1 of chapter 15. I'd like to read that together in unison. My text verse tonight, verse number 15, or chapter number 15, verse 1. Ready? And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. That last phrase, the last plagues, this is it. The seven last plagues. The uh, wrath of God is filled up. In fact, in chapter 16, verse 17, God says, it's done. This is it. I want to speak tonight on this subject, the shock and awe of the wrath of God. Shock and and all. Let's pray together. Father, for just a while, I pray that you'll meet with us in a special and unique way. Thank you that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can read and study the Word of God together. We believe your Word is in inspired of God. We believe it's inerrant. It's infallible. It's preserved for us in the King James Bible. We're thankful for that, that as English-speaking people, we have a copy of the inspired Word of God. Because we have a copy of the Scriptures in our hands right now, we believe we have your word, your breath, your wishes, your principles. We believe tonight we read your prophecy. And so I pray that we that hear will do more than just hear, but we will be doers of the word. May we cleanse ourselves as we prepare for the return of Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> for those of you... <clears throat> <clears throat> who are past 15, 20 years of age, you'll know what the phrase shock and awe means. Technically known as rapid dominance. It is a military doctrine. It's not just a media phrase. It's a military doctrine based on the use of overwhelming power and spectacular displays of force in order to paralyze the enemy's perception of the battlefield, but mainly to destroy its will to fight. I did not know this, but the doctrine was pulled out, pulled out of history and dusted off from the Roman Empire that sent their legions in just droves and droves into enemy cities, and they would concentrate on one area. Uh, Hitler used it in what was called the Blitzkrieg during World War II as he would send the Panzer tanks and others, and concentrate on one area and to a certain extent leave the rest of the battlefield alone while they tried to obliterate the will of the enemy. It's pulled out and dusted off by a man named Harlan K. Allman and James P. Wade in 1996 and is a product of the National Defense University of the United States. Shock and awe it is a battlefield tactic. I remember the phrase that the American media used the night that President Bush gave the order to bomb Baghdad in the massive air and ground assault of the Gulf War. How many of you remember that day? I remember that. We did not know. the. I thought, I thought when we were doing this, we're the only nation in the world that tells the enemy what we're going to do before we do it. And really about 24 hours prior, CNN and other news networks got a hold of this theory of shock and awe, and they said this is what it's going to be. They described what they... Saul as shock and awe, and truly it was as the bombs lit up the nighttime sky, literally leveling uh, by targeted aspect military installations within Baghdad and beyond. Just before nightfall on March the 21st, 2003, we found out later the massive deployment, dozens of F-14 Tomcats and F-A-18 Hornet strike planes loaded with bombs roared off the decks of the Kitty Hawk aircraft carrier, zeroed in on these critical targets in Baghdad just before dark. And by 10.30, listen to this, by 10.30 that evening, over 350 Tomahawk cruise missiles had been launched as well as the bombs. In the first 48 hours, over 3,000 bombs or missiles had landed in Saddam Hussein's stronghold. I remember that night. I remember watching it on television. And the first thing I thought was just how mighty America is, amen. But then I was thinking prophetically, as the video footage began to arrive back to America, we began to understand the shock and awe that the Iraqis felt during this war. 
and military and government buildings and arsenals were systematically destroyed. And the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation are going to be somewhat like that. Prophetically scheduled, I think, by God to deliver what I would call a divine shock and awe designed to bring man to his knees, especially the nation of Israel that had turned its backs for so many years on God. And you'll see by the end of the message tonight that even all of this in this last part of the tribulation period, man still fails to repent. This all started in the book of Revelation. Tribulation judgment began in chapter 6, verse 1, with the beginning of of the opening of the first seal of judgment, it continued until chapter 11, verse 15, with the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And for the past few weeks, we've been in chapters 12 through 14, which are considered parenthetical, parenthetical chapters uh, in uh, this prophecy book that actually detailed and defined some of the events that we had been reading in the previous chapters. Now with chapter 15 that we just read, all of that ends. In fact, this little chapter introduces the last of the tribulation judgments, the dreadful, vile, or bold judgments that God delivers to the angels to be poured out on the world. In just a moment, we'll get into those. I really have two parts, chapter 15, chapter 16. But I want to look first of all at chapter 15 where we have the preparation of the vile judgment. There's three sections here in chapter 15 of the preparation of the vile judgments. First of all, we see in verses 1 and 2 the great and marvelous sign that was given in verse number 1. The Bible says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels, <clears throat> having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory of the beast, and over the image, and his mark, and so forth. So the Bible says here, There is a great and marvelous sign. All of God's patience is now exhausted. And the final judgment on all of mankind is about to commence, and the judgments that we're about to read uh, are the most horrendous of all, called the vow or the plague judgments. The prophet Isaiah predicted this time would come in Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, that, that this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save? Wherefore thou art red in thine apparel, speaking of the blood-stained uh, garments, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. This is the last part of the seven years' tribulation. There's more to come. The earth is not completely destroyed, but I'm going to tell you what, it's bad times right here. And so we have here this marvelous sign. The sea of glass is mentioned in verse, verse, uh, 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 the verse 2. And, and also in Revelation 4 and 6 was a place of tranquility in heaven. And then also Solomon's temple had a sea of glass which typified the sanctification or cleansing of the Word of God. But here this sea of glass is mingled with fire. A beautiful picture, I believe, of the tribulation saints that died for their faith, taking their stand in the heat of persecution here on earth, but now enjoying the peace and tranquility of heaven, many of them. Now, this could be what the Apostle Peter was saying when he wrote this in 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, that though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. Now, that's speaking, of course, of New Testament saints, but also I'm thinking of those tribulation saints that go through such tremendous persecution. Nevertheless, these tribulation saints are mentioned here again, and they're described in verse number 2 in a fourfold way. First of all, Here's what the Bible says about those saved during the tribulation period. They, were, they had, haven't gotten victory over the beast. Somehow, God allowed them to sustain, be sustained, and they got victory of the beast. The Bible says they also uh, had gotten victory by not taking the mark of the beast, which was 666. <laughs> there were, <coughs> under, understand there will be people saved during that time, those that had not heard the gospel previous to the rapture, and there will be those who will be saved by the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, and they'll be uh, preaching the gospel, and these folks will be saved during that time. And we understand that they will not be able to take the mark of the beast. Uh, nobody goes to heaven that takes the mark of the beast. And they found a way to escape that. 
They now stand on this sea of glass, and they have been given harps in anticipation of singing the Victor song, which we're going to read in just a moment. These are special people. I'm glad that they make it into glory, but I'm also glad that I'm not part of their number because they're going to see things that you and I will never want to see. Notice, please, not just the great and marvelous sign, but secondly, we see the great and marvelous song mentioned in verses 4 and 5. They sing the song of Moses, servant of God, song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. We see several things here about this song. Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, we have already seen that the 144,000 Jewish uh, evangelists sing their new song. Now, and we know that you and I sing a song when we get the glory and the rapture. Now we see all of those who are saved in this tribulation and died for their faith will now sing their new song. They're now in heaven. Some of them, many of them caught up in some fashion. I don't understand how all that happens, so don't come and ask me because I don't know. Uh, Arnside knows and, and, and Van Impey knows and some of these other guys know, but they're smarter than me. Nevertheless, these martyrs blend their voices to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. We remember that song back in Exodus chapter 5. Moses sang that and wrote all that, and the people of Israel sang that. Just after the miraculous cross of the Red Sea, they got on the other side. They talk about how Pharaoh and his armies were drowned in the deep sea and all that. And I want you to understand when they sang that song, I'm sure they were jumping up and down. And understand that these martyrs were doing the same thing. They were excited about the new song that they were singing now that they're home with the Lord. Notice these truths that are found in the song in verses 3 and 4. First of all, <laughs> they acknowledge that what God has done in the tribulation period <clears throat> has been nothing short of great and marvelous. As we have read through these passages of Scripture, we're seeing things that we have never heard of before in our lifetime, humanly speaking. And so they're great and marvelous. They acknowledge also in the psalm that God is the Lord God Almighty. That is His highest name, Lord God Almighty. By the way, you and I need to understand that He is our Creator and He is our Lord God Almighty and He has the right to tell us how to live. They acknowledge that in the song. Sometimes we'll sing a hymn right here, and sometimes we'll mention His name, Lord God Almighty. Remember that we're giving Him the obedience and the reverence and the worship He needs. Uh, <clears throat> we see thoroughly in the song they attest to the fact that everything He has done and will do is justified and truthful. Let me just read that to you. He says, uh, the song goes, uh, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Watch this now. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, I just want to stop and say here that everything God does is just. Everything God does is truthful. And this world is worthy of God's vengeance. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't want to see anybody die and go to hell. I'm not for that. In fact, I try to do my small part of telling folks about the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand, and you're going to read just a moment, just how wicked and just how far away people can get from God when they don't want to repent. But I want you to know that we'll never be able to step back and say that God was not righteous and just in this vengeance that we're going to read here in just a moment. They sing that in their song. They, by the way, they probably had a little human reason to sing that. Many of these tribulation saints endured some awful, awful suffering. Many of them, most of them, will die, died martyrs' deaths. And uh, they announce, fourthly in this song, that all men shall give glory to God someday. Look what he says. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art, art holy, art, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. Here we see that there'll come a time that everybody will worship God. The Bible tells us in Romans 14, 11, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. And understand that some will do that. Willingly, because they're born again, we'll do that, I know, when we cast our crowns at Jesus' feet. We'll be so happy when we get to heaven, we'll shout glory, hallelujah to God. But there'll come a day when every eye shall see Him, and those who looked upon and pierced Him shall look upon Him. There'll come a day that everybody will acknowledge that God is God and Jesus Christ is His Son. And also in the psalm, they announce that God is the only one that's holy, and that they also announce the day that all nations will serve God not Antichrist, which is presently occurring as we read this passage. So we see here the great and marvelous song. We see also in chapter 15 this third thing, and that is this, the girded marching seven angels. These angels are dressed differently 
They're girded in golden girdles. And here we see the scene unfold in the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. And the Bible says, very unusually, that the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony was open. This could be the actual or symbolic uh, uh, of the eternal dwelling place of the ark of God. I do not know. I know that those of you who probably watched the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I did not read, that maybe that guy knows where that's at. Wild Man Jones or whatever his name is. I forget. His, I don't know. I, but he's wrong. And Hollywood's wrong on everything. Amen. But, but nevertheless, this could be actual or symbolic of the eternal dwelling place of the ark of God. We cannot be certain. But we do know that in the Old Testament, the area surrounding the Ark of the Covenant was off limits to all except the high priest of God. You couldn't go around that thing. Whenever they would take down the tabernacle and they would move that thing, then the uh, certain priests were able to put the staves in and carry the Ark. But once it was set, only the high priest could go in behind the Holy Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was at. Uh, and you heard stories about one time the, uh, in the Bible when David was trying to bring the Ark home, uh, one of the guys uh, tipped or excuse me, one the, they put it on a new cart and the thing tipped and one of the fellows reached out to, to, to set it back up on the cart and God killed him right there. God meant business with this particular ark because it was the place in the Old Testament of God's abode. Now we have the ark in heaven, rather literal and symbolic, only the Lord knows, but in the Old Testament it's off limits. Now, the beautiful thing for the New Testament believers, we can come nigh to the ark spiritually, the Bible says, in our prayer life because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You and I can what we can so call spiritually go behind the veil because of the blood of Christ. Symbolic of that high priest when he had the blood, of, uh, the, the blood on him, uh, symbolic of the, of the lamb and was able to carry that back there. He was able to go back behind the veil because of the blood. And you and I could do that symbolically because we're born again. You couldn't do that in the Old Testament. We do it in the New Testament because of Jesus Christ. Here we see they're doing it. It appears as though these tribulation saints are allowed to view these mysteries of the ark and of the tabernacle which have been shrouded for thousands of years. And truly this will be a wonderful sight for human beings to see. I, I do not have any idea what that's going to look like. But someday you and I will get to see God and these tribulation saints get a chance to do that for just a while. We see here also the seven angels. They march out of the temple of, the God, in, of God in heaven. They have in, uh, in the verse, uh, verse 6, the seven last plagues. They're called the last plagues in verse number 1. Their garments are pure and white uh, linen. They have on them a golden girdle of the high priest. Notice it is not the girdle around the hips of the high priest, but it is raised to the position around the chest, symbolizing judgment. Sometimes the high priest would keep the golden girdle on for worship purposes, and then whenever he would judge at the door of the, of the tabernacle, he would raise that to a place of judgment here. These angels are allowed to wear that particular piece of equipment of the high priest and wear it for these particular last plague judgments. I don't know why, other than the fact that I do know they symbolize judgment, and my judgment is about to be unleashed on earth like never before. One of the four beasts hands out a vow in verse number 7. The Bible says the vows contain the wrath of God. And you and I will just get a picture of what, that, what is contained in each vow in just a moment. But I don't think we have any earthly idea just how horrible this is going to be. These vows here uh, contain the wrath of God. These appear to come in the form of plagues upon man and on earth itself, which we'll see in chapter 16. Uh, he is described as the one God is, who, the one who lives forever and ever. May I, may I remind you tonight that sometimes you and I get in this uh, finite way and we forget that we're infinite. We forget that we're going to live forever. We get in this cloudy, uh, boring life. And you need to remember that not only do we serve a God that lives forever and ever and ever, but we're going to live forever and ever. And we need to live like that right now. And so God is the one who lives forever and ever. The temple in heaven is immediately closed. Boom. It was open for a while. Now, boom, it's closed because his judgment is about to begin. Smoke fills the temple coming from the glory of God and his power. And uh, no man is able to enter in until the vow of judgments have ended. Now, they'll get to go back in later on and chapters later. But now we move to chapter 16. In chapter number 15, we have the preparation of the vow of judgment. In chapter 16, we have 
Secondly, the pouring out of these vile judgments. Now, let me just stop and say that I could allude to some things that I think this may be, and I may give some little opinion. But the truth of it is, I don't think we know much more past the literal context of Scripture here. And I'll read that. And what we're going to read tonight is bad enough. We don't have to read much into it. Their first vial is poured out in verse number 1, chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, this is, I believe is the voice of God, Go your ways, pour out the vials of wrath, the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went, poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Here we see the verse vile poured out. We call this the vile, the plague of grievous sores, noisome, grievous, infectious sores. Every human being left on earth at this point has received the mark of the beast. And they're the ones worshipping the image of the beast. And they will all become infected by ulcerated sores on the skin. This was depicted, and some of these plagues were depicted back when Moses and Pharaoh were going at it. And it could be similar to that. I do not know. Now let me see, make some speculation. As you recall, that those who receive the mark of the beast will receive that mark in their forehead and in their forearm. I do not know how they'll be scanned on the skin, tattooed on the skin. Some believe there's a microchip that's implanted under the skin, which, by the way, is the process they're using right now. Uh, to mark animals and so forth and, and certain people in certain countries for medical records and all that. So the technology is all there. And I do not knew, know this for sure. And no doubt technology will change just the moment I say this because that's how fast it changes. But there are some that speculate and they believe that there is some type of chemical or some type of mineral inside those particular chips that for whatever reason will explode or begin to emit uh, their, their, their poison into the body of people. I do not know exactly if that's true or not, but there's some that believe that. Nevertheless, I promise you one thing, I'll never have that grievous sore because I'm out of here. I'll never have to be tempted to take the mark of the beast because I'm gone, praise God. And I'm just saying the first plague is poured out and it is going to be an awful, grievous sore. We see the second vial poured out in verse number 3. And the second angel poured out his vial. Uh, see the rapid succession of this. And again, we're talking about dominance here. We're talking about how God is conquering, he's overwhelmed with his power and his might right here. Rapid dominance, shock and awe. The first vial is poured out. The second vial is poured out. The Bible says, uh, upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul, uh, and every living soul died in the sea. So we have here uh, the second vial. The sea becomes blood. By the way, again, this has occurred in history once in the Exodus chapter 7. Verses 17 through 21, again, Moses and Aaron face off with Pharaoh. And uh, remember, the sea turned to blood and it stank and all the fish died. Now, when we talk about blood, we must pause for just a moment and remember the bloodshed that has already occurred on earth in the during the tribulation period. <clears throat> now, God can make this blood come from nowhere. That's, when, that's what he did when Moses uh, uh, smote the, the, the water there back in Egypt. So he get, God, God can make it come from nowhere. But we've got to understand that already in chapter 6, verses 3 through 4, in the opening of the second seal, brought great bloodshed on the planet. Again, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 8, <laughs> the blast of the second trumpet calls uh, a, a third of the sea to turn to blood, and all this will cause a horrendous stench throughout the land, similar to what the Egyptians again experienced there in Exodus. Now, I want you to think of that. So already some of this has occurred, and now all the sea is turned to blood. I can only imagine all the, uh, the uh, life there in the sea dies. But think of this. That which symbolizes life, blood, Exodus 17, 1, for the life of flesh is in the blood. And that which symbolizes salvation, 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Those things that symbolize life and that blood that symbolizes salvation now becomes a symbol of wrath and destruction, and condemnation. God just turns this whole thing around and really uses blood against mankind. We have now in verses 4 through 7, the third vow is poured out. In verses 4 through 7, the third angel poured out his vow upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and which wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. 
For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another uh, out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Here we have the third vial poured out. And now, not just the salt water uh, turns to blood, but all the drinking water, all the fresh water, all the fountains and all the water wells and all that turns and is contaminated with blood. Verse 6 tells us why. He said, well, why do you do that, God? I'll tell you why. For they've shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. That's why they've done it. Now they're going to drink blood. And uh, then uh, they turn around and they say, God is justified in his actions. He says, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Now remember, the apostle John is watching this. He's seeing this all played out. This in the future is literally going to happen. And I, I could not imagine the sea turning to blood. I couldn't imagine all the fresh water turning to blood. But the Bible says it's going to happen with the pouring out of this third vial. Now it's coming again in rapid succession. The fourth vial now is poured out in verses 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with great heat and blaspheme the name of God which hath, uh, which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. This is amazing to me. It's amazing to me. The prophet Isaiah, by the way, the fourth vial is the sun, sun's heat is somehow increased. The prophet Isaiah predicted this in uh, Isaiah 24, 6. Therefore hath the curse devoureth the, earth, devoureth the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. I thank God that he has designed the sun, the moon, the stars, a specific distance from the earth. I'm glad that God controls the tides. The Bible tells us in the book of Job that he says to the waves, come no further. And he's got a particular distance that the sun is from the earth. Thank God for that, but here, for some reason, he changes that. Or he turns up the dial of the thermostat of the sun. This occurs somewhere near the very end of the seven-year tribulation. Notice that when he does this, it scorches men. I, I don't know anything worse than having a terrible blistering sunburn, but they say you can go past that to where the sun can completely dehydrate and deplete your body of all water. And kind of say it's going to be a terrible, terrible time. Notice the, inhabit <coughs> the inhabitants of the earth blaspheme God. <clears throat> and they fail to repent. Have you ever seen somebody <clears throat> that it doesn't matter how wrong they are, they buck up and they fail to repent? I was watching just the other night on the news. There's a man that they had chased. He had shot somebody. And they had chased him down. They'd police had rammed his car. And they got him out. That man was so vile. He kicked. He screamed. He hollered. He did everything he could to take those officers out. He fought all the way to the back of that police car. I have police officers tell me that sometimes they'll put such vile criminals in the back of their car that even though they're caught... And even though they know they're guilty, they're literally to tear up the backs of those cars. Can I tell you that when we get to this place in the tribulation period, there'll be people that'll be so bent on bitterness and hatred toward God, they will do nothing to change their way. I'm going to tell you something, friend. Don't ever get like that. Don't get like that with authority. Don't get like that with God. Make sure you keep a tender heart. It's just not worth it. By the way, parents, you need to teach your children and break their will early so they don't ever get to the place where they think that they can overrule authority. I'll just stop there just saying the sun's heat increases. I do not know. But could the current argument regarding global warming right now be what is used to convince people that this is just going to happen anyway. Is this something that could just be explained away? I, again, I told you my position on global warming, but I did tell you that it would come someday. And I'm just saying that some of the things as we're being talked about right now in the news is getting 
people ready to go through the tribulation period. You and I are supposed to be smarter than that, amen? We see the fifth vow in verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, And the fifth angel poured out his vow upon the seat of the beast, seat, seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Now, I want you to understand, again, this rapid succession, this is coming, just boom, 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 boom. None of it's going away. I mean, one thing don't happen before another thing, uh, nothing ends, another thing comes, and then this, the, 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 the water's turned to blood. There's no way to quench your thirst. You've got this heat coming down. Now you've got this darkness coming on uh, the face of the earth. It's just coming, bam, bam, bam. The Bible says they gnaw their tongues for pain. This uh, fifth vow, some believe that God cast an eerie darkness upon the already spiritually dark empire of Antichrist, and he does so by shortening the days. Now, I don't have time to take you to the Scripture where they get this hypothesis, but uh, the heat, they say, as some of these writers say, is so intense that man cannot survive long in 12 hours of daylight. And the idea of God is to discipline the wicked, not necessarily kill them, to make them suffer. <laughs> and so there are some believe that the days are shortened somewhat. Again, the Egyptians felt this plague, uh, this chilling darkness uh, during the Exodus plagues. The Bible says it was darkness you could feel. Let me ask you a question just so you get maybe some idea of this. How many of you have ever been a place, maybe like down inside a cave or somewhere, how many of you have ever been in a place of total darkness and you turn the lights out, total darkness? I'm not talking about nighttime. You can't go anywhere outside in Murfreesboro. We got, you ever been anywhere where there's total darkness? A few people have been to a place where there's total darkness. I remember as a little boy. We went into the caves up in Carter Caves, Kentucky, just as a young boy. We went back later as a teenager. And I, I remember getting down inside this one cave called Bat Cave. And I remember we got inside there, and we, everybody turned all their lights off. And, and for the first time, I think I understood just a little bit about darkness that you could feel. There's just no way out of it. And the Bible says that they would have that type of darkness. Amos chapter 5, verse 18 spoke a little bit of this. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. <laughs> Somebody said, boy, just bring it on, Lord. We'll take the day of the Lord. We can handle it. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in the, my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. It is nigh at hand. And a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever like it, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And speaking of that day of darkness, the sixth vow now is poured out in verses 12 through 16. And the sixth angel poured out his vow upon the river <clears throat> Euphrates. Now watch this. Coming to an end. And the water thereof was dried up. The way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon that is Satan, the beast, Antichrist, and the mouth of the false prophet. <clears throat> For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew, called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. This sixth vowel is very important. He pours it out. And in pouring out that vowel, simply put, it was the stoppage of the Euphrates River. Either the river dries up but the importance of the river drying up, and by the way, if you look on your maps, you'll see there's a huge dam there that controls the river and the water. And uh, that is all occupied by people of Iran, Iraq, Syria. Whoever controls the dam controls the water. You say, why would God dry up the waters of the river Euphrates, one of the oldest rivers in the world? The Bible tells you why. So that this huge army the kings of the east, the kings of the orient, can bring across, as we learn in chapter 9, verse 16, this huge 
two million man army will cross over this river into the Middle East and into Israel. Now, let me just say this. China and other Oriental nations have these huge armies right now. This will be the largest military assembly in history of the world. They begin to prepare for this battle. Well, well preacher, are you saying they're going to come across on foot or whatever? Uh, 200, do you understand how many people? 200 million people. They're not going to have enough planes and troop carriers to carry all them people in. They're going to come across that desert. That river's going to dry up. They're going to come across with their artillery, their tanks, or whatever they have. And the Bible says it will make it manageable for this huge army to come up on little Israel. They'll be joined by the kings from other nations here, according to the Bible, these verses. They'll form this coalition. In verse number 13, we see how this happens. The satanic trinity finally exposes the demonic spirits which have empowered them and guided them. Uh, the Bible says they're like frogs. They're not literally frogs, but a picture of the slime and unclean and grotesque nature of Satan and his ways. And understand that right now this generation that he conceals himself as an angel of light. But Satan is the most wicked, grotesque, vile thing that you'll ever want to be around. You need to understand that. Some of the music right now of Satan, rock music and so forth, some of the things that's out there, that some of you begin to enjoy for some reason or another, you need to understand just how vile and wicked that is and who that came from. We understand that he here exposes himself. Verse 14, these devils that come out of them will deceive the world's kings to join this coalition in great battle. Verse 15 is a challenge to the remaining tribulation saints to watch and take their stand. In my Bible, it's red letter. In other words, this is a word from Jesus himself. For Jesus will truly come in what's called the second coming. He's already come for us in the rapture. There could be a little, little illusion here again. As I said at the beginning, that as we see these things come to pass, it means we're that much closer, even as New Testament saints, we're that much closer to the return of Christ. So he could be telling us as well, keep our garments clean. That means keep your life pure. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop and say this again. I said at the beginning, I want to say it right here. Use Bible prophecy to alarm you a little bit and clean yourself up. If you thought Jesus Christ would come back tonight, I promise you, you'd be making some changes right now. You talk about a full altar, we'd have one. And I'm not saying that to get a full altar. I'm saying that to make sure that you're working at keeping yourself pure for God. And so we see that these, these uh, wicked demons forms this coalition. And God challenges us uh, to be ready to meet Him. Now the seventh vial is open. I call this the grand finale of the wrath of God. And it's a I, I just come so fast. Look at this. And the seventh angel poured out his vial uh, into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. The other angels appeared to fly over and pour theirs out on earth. This angel just says, takes his and throws those up in the air. Now the earth begins to react. Look at this. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city that is Jerusalem was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And uh, the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. What in the world? The grand finale of God's wrath. The seven seals have been opened. The seven trumpets have blasted. The three, three woes, woe, woe, woe upon man, humanity, have been sounded. And now in rapid succession, God brings this earth to its knees with the pouring out of these seven vials. The Bible says here, the Lord declares, it's done. This part is done. Now, there'll be a couple 
parenthetical passages, which again will describe the Battle of Armageddon and some of the last battles. But here is the close of the judgments. I thought about this. I thought about every year for the 4th of July. <clears throat> we uh, take our lawn chairs. We go up back on the soccer field and we shoot off fireworks. I love that. I just li love the watermelon, love the fellowship, love the fireworks. But the guys that put that on, they always save a whole bunch of them back for the grand finale. And boy, here it comes. And you can tell when it's over. Boom, 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 boom. It just starts. To, it just, it's just, now, by the way, that's beautiful and that's spectacular. But here it just seems like these plagues come one, two, three, four, five, six, and then boom, just like the grand finale. Notice, please, in this grand finale, voices and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake comes. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's an, it, I don't know what the voices are. I can just imagine how eerie it is. I know that when there's some kind of scary sci-fi film out there, they always got this wild music and this, these voices and people screaming and carrying on. just makes the hair stand up on the back here. And I will tell you that it, it just goes nuts in this grand finale. The uh, thunderings, there's nothing more hair-raising than thundering, uh, hitting lightning, hitting close to you, and lightning bolts hitting the ground. And I'm going to tell you what, folks will be running and screaming and carrying on. Then the great worldwide earthquake like they never has seen anything like it the world has never seen anything like what's going to happen in this grand finale jerusalem is divided into three parts not destroyed but divided into three parts the bible says here all the great cities of the world are destroyed i'm talking about new york's gone and paris is gone and moscow is gone and dallas is gone and on and on they're gone they're gone beijing is gone it's gone it's all gone the cities are gone the bible says here that babylon suffers the greatest plague of all and, and and some believe this is the the world economy is all over the bible says the islands of the sea are gone i mean barbados is gone and the bahamas are gone and and hawaii is gone and and all it's gone uh, some of you have vacations planned there i know i'm sorry but this is in the tribulation period so go ahead and take a vacation nevertheless the bible says that the mountains are flat and the mountains are gone I'm man think of the the destruction when this last vial is poured out. Hailstones, the Bible says, fall upon men. The weight of a talent. The weight of a talent depends on if it's a Latin talent, a Greek talent, or a Jewish talent. Is anywhere between 86 pounds to 120 pounds. My wife has one of these weight ball things that you you exercise with it setting the claws has got dust on it we don't use it but nevertheless she's got one of them i don't i don't know how much it weighs it probably weighs three pounds about about the size of a bowling ball does anybody know what i'm talking about i'm thinking man if that would fall out like hell that would hurt really bad wouldn't it but 86 pounds that's about the size of a small gorilla and not just one of them. But when hail comes down, I mean, it really, really comes down. We have it here. By the way, if you just moved here, you moved to Tornado Alley. And most time before a tornado comes, all this hail comes. And we ha we've had it the size of a golf ball before. Just stack up in our windows. We've had it like that before. And I thought, boy, I'm sure glad I wasn't out in that. But could you imagine 86 pounds? I would think that somebody would get right with God. Look what the Bible says. The last part. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. As we read chapter 16, this worldwide destruction seems so brutal. But we need to understand that God has given man over 7,000 years of human history to get right with Him. And over 2,000 years of what we call the age of grace to make a decision that God is the only true God and the Creator of the universe. He's the Lord God Almighty. He has a right to everything we do. And that Jesus Christ is His Son. In our text, in the book of Revelation, as we've studied this now for the past seven years, man has worshipped Antichrist, who is the devil in human skin. 
And the only thing the Lord was trying to do was to bring Israel back to him. That's what the tribulation period is for. And anybody else, he gets to repent in these last days. There's something that you need to know about God. Because I wouldn't want anybody to walk out here and say that God is a bad God. Because he's not a bad God. He says this, he makes this very declaring statement in Isaiah 42, 8. And I quote, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. God does not take lightly anybody who worships Antichrist, the devil, the world, themselves, Again, he says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, that is, false gods, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and unto the third and fourth generation to them that hate me. And by the way, we saw at least in two places in this scripture where the world still hated God. He goes on to say this, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. It's so clear to me. Why wouldn't somebody want to love God and keep his commandments? He's such a wonderful God. But yet there are people that hate God. You say, preacher, don't you think he'll show the people in these other nations just a little bit of grace that worship these other gods? I'd love to tell you, yes, but no. He's not going to give his glory to any false god. In fact, in the Ten Commandments, he tells us to never bow down to some graven image. And yet there are people that do that. May you never experience the shock and awe of God. He has something better for all of us. Turn to please to chapter 21. I'll teach on this a little later on, but I know that everything just seems so awful but God is purging the world finally of people that hate him in chapter 21 we see a new heaven new earth there's no more sea and verse number two John sees the holy city coming down verse three and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people the cloud is lifted the smoke is gone we get a command to be where God's at. God himself shall be with them and be their God. Watch this now. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. All this stuff we're reading about is gone. It's gone. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, that is the Apostle John, he says, Now, John, write, 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 write. These, these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. No more blood water. I mean, we're talking about fresh, crisp, sparkling, cool water. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He goes on and tells a story about how beautiful heaven is. We sing a song, how beautiful heaven must be, sweet land of the happy and free. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That is going to be our eternal state someday. Not what we read about. But because we read that, we should do all we can to get people to Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and no one's looking around. I trust tonight that you're born again and you've got that settled and you know that heaven's your home. In just a moment, if you have never done that, we'd love to have you come. In just a moment, we'll sing a hymn of invitation. We'd love for you to come to Jesus Christ. We don't want anybody doubting that. We want you to have that set on your heart. But I want to ask you to do one more thing, too. I want you to make a decision tonight to tell others about Christ and let God. Many of you raise your hands this morning that you have loved ones that need to come to the Lord. 
Let's stand together, please, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. How many would say this, preacher? I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I've got that all settled. I've got that all settled. Would you put your hand up? I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Got that all pinned down. God bless you. Thank you. Many hands raised. What a wonderful sight. I love the family of God. We're all going to be together someday in heaven. We better get along down here because we're going to be together. Many hands are raised right there. Maybe you could not raise your hand right there. Why don't you come and trust Christ today? Lean to that person next to you and say, you know what, I just need to get this settled. Would you go with me? They'll come with you. Would you just come on? Now, I'm going to ask you one more thing. We're born again. Many of you raise your hands. You're born again. Now, we're commanded to tell others about Christ. And I'm going to ask you, how many say, preacher, God stirred me up tonight. I don't want my loved ones to go through any of that. If that's going to happen, and it is, I want to tell them about the Lord. Preacher, would you pray for me? that I'll tell my loved ones about Christ. Would you lift your hand? I want to tell my loved ones about Christ. Many hands raised. Now, folks, tonight, let's put feet on that. Let's get out of here and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe tonight you want to come and call their name out in prayer right here. Let's, let's call their name out and start praying for them right now. Father, bless this invitation. Speak to hearts tonight. Thank you for the men who lifted their hands and said they were saved. Maybe there's others here that could not lay, lift their hand. I pray they'll come and be saved tonight. Oh, God, please speak to their hearts. May your Holy Spirit plead with them right now to come. Give them the boldness to step out and do just that. They'll find a friend down here at this altar. Maybe a loved one needs to step out with them next to them and come down with them. Lord, I pray you'll bless many hands raised of those who have loved ones that need to be saved. Help us to have the boldness we need to tell them about Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. This altar is open.